everybody, Taylor Torrance here, and I just want to do a short project walkthrough of the baseline in my new remix out now on enhanced music of Paul Tarrant's Sunset Serenade. So let's jump into it. All right, so here we are in the project, and as you can see, there is a lot going on in here, more than I could ever hope to cover in a short walkthrough video. And I actually even deleted some channels that were slowing the project down. So for today, we are just going to stick with this bass line that comes in the middle of the track. Uh, it's a big moment in the song, and I think it's probably one of the more interesting things that I could talk about here in a walkthrough. The way this track is arranged, there's a DJ intro. There's this sort of atmospheric breakdown. Here, I'll play this portion of it really quickly. You'll hear there's ocean waves. There's some wind chimes. That was meant to sort of evoke the concept of the sunset and Sunset Serenade. Um, and then I changed Paul's original chord progression. I wanted to put my own spin on things, but I kept his original melody from 2010, which comes in right here. Really love that melody. I thought, you know, that was the focal point of the track that I wanted to pay homage to with, uh, with Paul's original track. So then that breakdown builds up to this definitive moment in the track where the vibe immediately changes and we go into this really heavy um, bass drop. And the track obviously finish up, finishes up with more traditional a chord drop. So um, let's focus on this bass drop for today. So I'm going to play the beginning of it and then we'll walk through some of the layers, how I approached it and how I got it to sound, how it sounds. So here you go. All right, so as you can see, there's a lot going on in there. And in fact, if you take a look at the layering here, we start at channel 110, and that goes all the way to 137. So there's 27 bass layers. And then this percussion that goes through all the way to 153, that's also contributing to the bass groove. So we're looking at, you know, a good 40, 42 layers of bass drop stuff that makes this sound the way that it sounds. So let's jump into that. All right, so I've started to expand some of these channels, some of these groups, and we're just gonna take things kind of one at a time. And I'll show you how this bass drop progresses over the course of the phrase. So first we start with this, uh, with this growl. Uh, this is a little bit loud, watch your volume, um, but I'll play it solo. So there's that variation. Then it comes into a slightly different type of growl. So I'll walk you through each of these. So in Serum, um, what I did here is there's a growl where got a lot of processing going on within Serum, but what's happening here to make it sound the way that it sounds and kind of evolve and sound quote unquote growly is this, uh, this LFO that's modulating the wavetable position. So this uh, this modulates the wavetable position that much. So it takes it from here all the way to the top and it follows this curve. And when it reaches the apex of this curve is when it reaches the apex of this knob. So I spent some time playing with the shape of this LFO to get the sound uh, to sound the way I wanted it to. So I'll, I'll solo that channel and you can see the line move and the knob will move. One moment. Okay, here we go. So you can see that it follows that line. So that's how that bass draw or that uh, that growl is made. Processing wise, got some Camel Crusher on here. Let's select the right one. Sorry, processing wise, we have Camel Crusher. I rarely use the Annihilate preset, but in this case, it felt appropriate. <laughs> it's kind of like a, almost like a dubstep growl here. I have OTT, turned off the lows, pretty deep depth. I usually don't go that high, but again, I wanted to go aggressive here. And then I'm using a free plugin called Saturation Knob. Uh, this is free from Softube. 
love this one. And what I try to do, my approach with saturation in general, is I don't like to use the same saturation chain or the same saturation plugins on a lot of sounds in the mix. I like to really vary that up because you want different colors and different flavors of saturation throughout your track among your layers. That's how you get the track to sound bigger, richer, more harmonic. If you're using the same saturation processing on all or most of your sounds in the mix, things are gonna start to sound really homogenous and it's not going to sound as rich and harmonic as you want it to be. You don't want the same saturation being applied throughout your track. You want it to be varied. It's gonna make things more interesting as well. So we have that growl. Then we have the second layer here that's just a really, really basic low mid saw wave. Just filling up the low mids there, almost no processing on it. And then this third growl is actually the same basic serum patch of the first growl, but what you'll notice is, see everything's the same here, but the LFO shape is different. So instead of being like that, like the other one was, this one's inverted. So you get a slightly different character on the way the growl sounds. So let me solo that and play it. You'll hear it has a different character to it and that's because of this LFO shape modulating again this wavetable position. I've also got slightly different processing. Just talking again about how you want slightly different saturation. So I've got the British Clean preset instead of the Annihilate preset. OTT actually is letting the lows through and no soft tube saturation knob on this one. So um, also again, I didn't mention this before, but I've got this plate reverb on the first one that just expands out the, the reverb for one second and then shuts, it clamps down after the second. And that gives a more expansive sort of dimension to that first, that first bass growl, which I really wanted because it sets off the drop. So. Anyway, moving forward, we have that growl. Then we have this group of four layers, which, you know, each of them are really simple. Together, they just build up to the thickness that I wanted. So I'm not gonna walk through each of these because it's a pretty simple noise, pretty simple sound. But here are the first two sort of bass hits in this bass line. So that second hit is just these four layers that, again, together, um, just together, they, they got the thickness that I wanted. I just EQ'd them slightly separate, slightly differently, uh, processed them a little bit. You know, we're just using presets here, simple stuff. So after that first growl and the second hit, we then go into what I think of as kind of the side trance portion of this bass line because it has these really short percussive hits that kind of remind me of side trance. Um, and they're really simple. Uh, the concept with these really is less complicated than you might think. I've got a lot of questions about how I got them to be so punchy. It's really just this. I'm going to show you right here. It's a really basic, I mean, this is just some sort of basic wave. Um, and what I'm doing here is this envelope is modulating the noise level, just pink noise, and the level of this oscillator, okay? What I did is I pulled this decay down. So you see it's really short and spiky. So the actual volume of the wave is being affected by this envelope. So when it plays, you'll see these 16th notes, I believe they are, each of them goes really, really quickly. Okay, so that's how I get that percussiveness. Now these are, these are frozen layers, but they're all the same concept. So I'm gonna play each of these four layers here, or three layers. And all of them were done the same way. Choose an interesting wave for your oscillators within your synth. Maybe mix a couple of different waves and then either uh, use the envelope on the amplitude or also on the filter, or one or the other. And just get it really tight and pull down the decay so that it gets that really punchy percussiveness. And um, you can see here in the ones that are frozen, you can see the waveform. It, you can see how it kind of has that spike and then it clamps down. That's what you're looking for when you want to get those really short percussive bass hits. So for a long time while I was working on this bass line, I only had these sort of side trance like hits and it was feeling a little empty to me still. So what I ended up adding was this layer here along with this layer. So you'll see that while this, uh, 
these percussive, short, punchy hits are playing, you've also got this layer in the background. When I play the entire mid-bass group together, you'll hear it in the background as well. It really fills out that, that section where the percussive hits are coming through. And, um, you know, it just, it just kind of makes the entire, this, this entire middle portion of the phrase a lot thicker, richer. It adds some harmonics that aren't in your face in the way that the Psytrance basses are but add a lot more thickness to uh, the bass line overall. Uh, again, after these hits, we could then go into a second variation on the Psytrance type theme. You'll hear that here. And those, again, are really no different than these other layers. It's just to add some variation. Let's see what we have going on here. Okay, cool. So Growls, second hit, Psytrance 1, Psytrance 2 with that background layer adding thickness. And then we go into these two layers, which sort of round out the, the halfway point of the baseline phrase, if you will. Take a listen to these. Okay, so let's play the baseline up to this section before it sort of turns around in, into the second part of the phrase. So after that, again, we touched upon that second growl. That's where the phrase started, starts, sort of starts over again. We get the growl, the second hit, each of those side trance elements. And then instead of these hits on the second part of the phrase, we get this, what I call the turnaround. Let me solo these groups in addition to the bass line. And then I'm gonna play it up to that point now. Okay, so that, that happens quickly. It's really punchy, but you'll notice right here. Now, that's where uh, things get pretty interesting because most of that work is not being done by bass, bass sense. If I were to play this section of the bass line just without these drum groups, you'll hear there's something missing here. That's because a lot of the work that's being done toward the end of that phrase is being done by these drum layers. These are just short, really tight percussion, and I really wanted to use these to add to the punch of that second part and get it really, really tight. I also like to use um, audio here because you'll see what I'm doing on a lot of these is I'm fading the, ta the tails. That's to get them even tighter, to, to control the attack, to control the decay of each of these, and get them even more punchy. So um, if I play just these drum layers without the bass. You can kind of hear what they're adding there to the end of that turnaround. For instance, here's one that I've just changed the volume and adjusted the tails. OK, here's a tom, another, another percussion. These are really, really short, uh, really percussive, like pretty quiet actually, but they just add on to the attack of the bass synths that are playing. Because what's actually playing here, let's see, yeah, I'll solo this. It's really simple. That on its own would not be very full, but if I solo that along with these bass groups or these uh, drum groups, that's what's really giving the turnaround its interest. I also just want to cover one more thing that's adding to this entire bass line. In the same concept that we were talking about with these drum groups, these drum percussion layers that are adding on to the percussiveness of the bass, the entire time I've got white noise playing that's simulating hi-hats, and it's just playing straight 16ths during select portions of the bass groove. Let me solo that for you. Notice how I EQ it there. So now you've got a better sense for everything that's going on here. Oh, wait, one more thing. This pluck verb, that's what I think is really one of the more interesting parts of the bass line. Uh, check this out. So that comes in right at the end of the turnaround. 
I'll play it all together. The secret there, in addition to you know this this processing, is the uh, the automation on the reverb. So I actually just went ahead. In this case, I liked the way the reverb was sounding right out of Spire. Um, and you'll see I just cut off or I take down the reverb and keep it down until later on so that I don't, I'm controlling that reverb tail. It sounds really short. And it just, as soon as we get back in to the, the um, next portion of the bass line, it's already off by the time the side chain comes back. So. You can hear the effect there. So yeah, I hope that was helpful. Uh, I've got a lot of questions about this bass line, so I hope that sheds some light on my process. I know it's complicated, we covered a lot. Hopefully I didn't lose you along the way, but if I did, or if you have any other questions, hit me up, at Taylor Torrance. You guys know where to reach me, at least I hope so by now. And uh, yeah, again, I hope you're loving the track and look out for more music for from me later this month.